we can finally begin class. Um, this class is going to be on the redemption of Israel. The redemption of Israel. And I want to start off with the definition of redemption. So this is redemption. The definition of redemption. The act of making something better or more acceptable. Okay, so redemption is the act of making something better or more acceptable. Get the second one, though. What? The, no, not you. Him. Yeah, there you go. The act of exchanging something for money, an award, etc. So the act, the, the redemption is the act of exchanging something for, for money, an award, etc. So you're exchanging one thing for another thing. That's redemption. All right, so... Get the next definition. Give me redeem. All right, let's see this one. This is redeem. Compensate for the faults or bad aspects of something. I want the second one. Gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. It says to gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. So read that sentence they got below it. His best suit had been redeemed from the pawnbrokers. Meaning he's regaining it. It was his already. He took it to the pawnbroker. And to redeem it, he had to get the pawnbroker the money back. Then they gave him his suit back. Read some, some of these synonyms. Retrieve. Retrieve. Regain. Uh -huh. Recover. Recover. Get back. Get back. Re meaning, not get back, but get back. Reclaim. Mm -hmm. Repossess. Repossess. Now, I know a lot of us know that one. <laughs> Repossess. <laughs> They're like, oh yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, it was here a minute ago. Like when that thing had happened that time. Yeah. I know I parked right And there. I was right there. <laughs> Some people park around in somebody else's house. They just right. walk back, get you done. Mm -hmm. But so, redemption and redeem. These are two words I want us to focus on, on as we read through these scriptures. Let's go to Second Samuel chapter seven and twenty-three. of 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 23. <clears throat> and what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself. God went to do what? Redeem for a people to himself. So God went to gain us as a people to himself. Read on. And to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible, for thy land, before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt. He did what? Redeemest to thee from Egypt. He redeemed us from Egypt. From the nations and their gods. So he brought us <clears throat> apart from the nations and their God. He redeemed us from Israel. I mean, from Egypt, right? Read on. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. Wait a minute. He said he's confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. He confirmed it. This is it's confirmed. We don't have to look up confirmed, do we? No, he said we do. Give me confirmed. Let's make sure. And we ain't going to leave nobody behind. What does confirm me? No, the other way. It, we already, no, what you doing? It's right there. Just go down. Yeah, that's good. We we'll take this. Confirm. Establish the truth or correctness of something previously believed, suspected, or feared to be the case. Mm -hmm. So he confirmed, he established the truth or correctness of us 
being his people forever. Did that help a little bit? It's established. This thing has been established. We're going to touch that word too. And, and I'm going over these certain things and I'm pointing out certain words because we usually read past these. We don't focus on them. We don't think about what they mean and apply that meaning to the rest of the stuff around that word. But once you do that, the picture becomes that much more clear. So he confirmed, right? Go to Galatians 3 and 13. This is the book of Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 13. Uh -huh. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? Somebody give me an answer for that. What's the curse of the law? Let me get this, brother. It's law leadership. The curse of Deuteronomy 28. Oh, yeah, that's the curses. That's the curse of the law. It's Deuteronomy chapter 28. The curses. That's what that's going into. Read on. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now jump down to verse 17. Verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. The covenant that was confirmed before in God, of God in Christ. Read. The law, mm -hmm. which was for 130 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Yeah, all kind of words in there that we need to know what they're talking about so we can understand the scripture. Read that again. I won't, I'll just point the words out. Read. And this I say, that the covenant... Covenant? We should understand. Who understands covenant? Should be everybody. Who does not understand covenant? Okay, pull up the definition for covenant. Because if you don't understand it, that means the scripture will lose what it's saying somewhere. But no, I, oh, I got it in there. Yeah, there you go. What does covenant mean? Covenant. An agreement. Uh-huh. Read the synonyms. Contract. Agreement. Undertaking. Commitment. Guarantee, warrant, pledge, promise. Promise, agreement, contract. We have, an, a con we have a contract with the Most High. We have an agreement. He said, will you keep these laws? And I'm gonna, if you keep these laws, I'm going to make you my people. We said, yes, Lord, we'll keep those laws and we want to be your people. Now we have an agreement. Now we, we have a course of action that we're saying that we're going to undertake with one party providing something and another party providing something. That's a contract, we have an agreement. So, read that verse 17 again. Verse 17, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed be That covenant was also confirmed. Meaning it was, pull up confirm again, I don't wanna step on it. I don't wanna get, use the words, it was established. So that agreement was established, right? Read on. That was confirmed before of God in Christ. Uh -huh. The law, which was 430 years after. 430 years after what? After jo Joseph went into Egypt, because that time period was 430 years. Read. Cannot disannul. That it should make the promise of the promise. That's another one of them words that we should be, it should automatically jump out. As soon as you see these words, you should be like, wait a minute. Covenant. Confirm. Promise. It should automatically send your mind down the right path. Read on. That cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So let's go into this confirmation first. Let's deal with the confirmation part of it. Go to 2 Esdras chapter 7 and 28. This is the part of the confirmation of the promise. 2 Esdras chapter 7 and 28. This is the book of 2 Esdras chapter 7 
and verse 28. For my son, Jesus, shall be revealed with those that be with him, and they that remain shall rejoice within 400 years. So that's 400 years after the time of Ezra. Read. After these years shall my son Christ die, mm -hmm. and all men that have life. So it says, after these years shall my son die, and all men that have life. So this, whether you know it or not, this is part of the confirmation. Let's prove it. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. This is all part of the confirmation of what? The covenant. Remember, that's what the scripture was dealing with. The, co the covenant and the confirmation of it. This is it. This is the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and verse 1. Come on. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So the first covenant had a, a divine, it had, what did it say? Also ordinances of divine service. This was the sacrificial law. That was the main part, or one of the main parts of the original covenant was the sacrificial law, the divine, what did they call it? Service. Service, which was done by the priesthood. So that was all contained within the original covenant, right? Drop down to verse 11. Verse 11. But Christ. But, so now I just want to skip down. I want to establish the first covenant. Now we're dropping down to verse 11. We're going to go to, now we're in Christ. Now we're getting into the new covenant, or what we call the New Testament. Come on. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption he for us. What? Obtained e eternal redemption for us. We remember that this, we started it off reading the definition of redemption and redeem. Pull redemption up again. You should be able to just go back more and it should be found. Okay. So what did he do? Is this an exchange of, for something of value? What was that? Because they put on here the act of saving for sin. Ignore that because that's not that doesn't apply to what we're reading. That's their definition. But the one, the exchange of something of value does apply. What was exchanged? What was the exchange that was made here? Does anybody know so far what that exchange was that was made? Get a brother the mic. Stand up because they don't know who wrote his hand. Blood of Christ. Exactly. That was his life. His life was the exchange. We're going to get more into that. Read on. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the, the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So this is how he redeemed us. He redeemed us back into the Father by his blood. Read. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Because he gave his life to bring us into the new covenant, he is the mediator of that covenant. Meaning it has to go through him. The first covenant, what did we do? We went through Moses. Everything was through Moses for us to get to God. Now, as Christ is the new mediator, we have to go through Christ to get to God. Understand? Yes, Come on. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were... Wait, 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 wait. It's for... He died for the redemption of the transgressions. Three, that were under the first testament of the ones that were under the first testament 
When you understand just that basic right there, nobody can tell you that. What about everybody? John 3, 16. No, God loves it. No, this is not what this is talking about. He's, read it again. And 15 for, again. Verse 15. <laughs> and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That so this is about to give you a description of what the New Testament pertains to. Read. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. He didn't say everybody. He says he's dying for the redemption, meaning that he's going to regain and bring back those that were under the first testament. Read. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. They might receive, remember I pointed out that word before, the promise of eternal inheritance. Was a promise in this Bible made to any other nation other than Israel? So how does how do we get that this New Testament is talking about everybody? God loves all, anybody can get into the kingdom. But just by looking at the different words that's being used and the way it's worded, and not reading it past them and saying, well, wait a minute, that's no way in the world that's talking about that. Christianity, they will use this same verse and still try to apply it to the world without understanding even the words they speak. To. Come on. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. <laughs> it's like where a testament is, there must be a death of the testator. Just like you have a will in the testament, right? And in the will, I might say, when I die, uh, Brother Zephaniah, he can get all my stuff, my car, my TV, everything. Can you go get that now? Well, when do you get it? You got to wait till I die. You can't have it before. Because, no, that wasn't the agreement. The agreement is, is that it does not go into force until I die. So when does the New Testament start? It don't start until you die. That's why all your Bibles got that page in there that say New Testament right at the beginning of Matthew when they start breaking down the beginning of his life. That's not where the New Testament would begin. It does not begin until he dies. So you got to go to the back of Matthew when, they, when he died on the cross. That's the beginning of the New Testament. Read on. Verse 17. For a testament is a force after men are dead. The New Testament did not go into force until after he died. Go ahead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay, so we understand that, right? And everybody clear so far? Okay, so now go to Hebrews 8 and we'll start at verse 6. This is the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. So this covenant is better. He's the mediator of the new covenant, which is also a better covenant. Why is it better? Somebody tell me why this new covenant is better. Somebody get the brother stand up so you can see who to get the right to. We don't gotta uh, shalom, shalom. Yo, what's your name, bro? Uh, brother Ira. Okay. Cause we don't gotta uh, sacrifice bulls and goats. We can go uh, high side sacrifice. So we can... I like that. What else? Somebody want to help? Him? Anything else? Put in the back. Shalom, brother Shalom. Uh, cause there were uh, sins that you couldn't be forgiven for under exactly. the old covenant, and so Christ gives that. Exactly. Like what? Yeah. yeah give us an example. Like homosexuality. Mm-hmm. What else? Adultery. What else? Uh, witchcraft. Mm-hmm. Idolatry. Breaking the Sabbath. Breaking the Sabbath. Bestiality. All right. Disobeying your parents. You got killed. Now, under this better covenant, you can repent. There was no repentance for those things back then. You went out and committed adultery. You was killed. You and her. Dead. All this room will probably be dead right now. But because we are under the new, better covenant from the death of Christ, 
Now we can repent. We can say, you know what? That was wrong. I'm not going to do that again. Confess my sins to the most high and never do it again. I, I, I remove that from my books. That's off the books now. I got erased. It's like, nope. That didn't even exist no more. That's gone. But obviously, you know how Christianity used that? <laughs> They'll say, the law is done away with so we can do whatever we want to do. Yeah. It's lawful. Yeah. Well, they won't say it's lawful because, I don't know, it, it's it's a mind game where they'll say, yeah, you just repent. So what are you repenting for if God's laws are done away with? <laughs> right? You know I, I, I be asking them stuff like this. And like, oh, okay. They be like, well, you know, no, we're not under the Old Testament. We're not under the law. Oh, so I can kill you. Well, no, no. What do you mean? <laughs> I should be able to murder you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> What's wrong? And when I get done murdering you, I should be able to run your pockets. <coughs> they say, praise Jesus. I won't do this no more and keep going. Right. I can't do that? No. Oh, oh. Well, I don't understand what you're telling me. <laughs> so, and they don't understand what they're telling you. <laughs> Just, it, especially once you highlight it, it may be really, it's look, oh, wait a minute. I don't, I don't want to go back and forth. They, they try to end the conversation around right the context. They're like, this don't make no sense. <laughs> Let me just stop. I don't want to argue. Maybe I didn't understand the way Pastor broke it down. I can't really repeat it. Right. <laughs> All right, so finish that up. Verse 7. For if that first covenant have had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Mm -hmm. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He established it. It's confirmed. How did it get confirmed? Christ died. It's locked in now. We are now under that new, better covenant. We have been redeemed, or we have redemption from what? Our sins. Now we've been redeemed and brought back in. You understand? That was, I, I might have lost somebody. That ain't sound right. <laughs> hey, catch up. <laughs> the first Chronicles 17. And I want verse 20. This is the book of First Chronicles, chapter 17 and verse 20. <coughs> O Lord, there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people Israel, whom God went to redeem, to be his own people, to make thee a name of greatness and terribleness, by driving out nations from before thy people, whom thou hast redeemed out of Egypt. He redeemed us or took, uh, get back, give me that redeem again. I want to get that definition one more time. Go forth, yep, man, you in the spirit. He regained possession of us. But it says in exchange for payment. What payment? How much did he give Pharaoh to get us out of there? He ain't no money. Maybe he didn't redeem us then. Maybe he stole us out of Egypt. But it says, the definition says that it is to gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. So, well, let's try to figure out the payment. Let's figure out the payment to see if he actually redeemed us out of Egypt. Go to Wisdom of Solomon 18 and 5. This is the book of Wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha, chapter 18 and verse 5. And when they had determined to slay the babes of the saints, one child be cast forth and saved. So they determined to destroy the, the babies of the saints. Yeah, one child was cast forth, forth and saved. That's baby Moses. This is talking about our time in Egypt, right? Read. To reprove them. Thou tookest away the multitude of their children, and destroyest them altogether in a mighty water. 
of that of that night were our fathers certified afore, that assuredly knowing unto what oath they had given credence, they, they might afterwards be of good cheer. Mm -hmm. So they said they would be of good cheer after the Egyptians were destroyed all together in mighty, a mighty water. What was that? They went through, they tried to follow us through the Red Sea. He destroyed them with a mighty water, right? But read the next part. Verse 7. So of thy people was accepted both the salvation of the righteous and destruction of the enemies. So we had to accept our salvation and their destruction. Our salvation was directly connected to their destruction. They went hand in hand. To destroy, to save us, he had to destroy them. Right? Y'all understand that? Okay. Go ahead. Verse 8. For wherewith thou didst punish our adversaries, by the same thou didst glorify us, whom thou hadst called. So, so the question is, is, what was the payment? He just got us out of there. What was the payment? Give the brother the mic. Shalom, leadership. Hey, shalom. Uh, the plagues. That was the payment? Okay. Anybody else? I'm not saying that's wrong. Shalom, leadership to, hey, uh, to death of our enemies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the plagues, but the ultimate payment was their lives. They had to die because some of the plagues, they didn't die. That's why I was like, that's good, but it was their death, so we're going to prove that too. That was our pay that was the payment. Like to get them out of there, the payment, the cost of it is y'all gotta die. Watch this. Let's right. go. Oh, go ahead. No, I just gonna say and they had to accept that. Yeah, and we had to accept it. Oh, for us to get out of here, you gotta kill them. And we did accept it. Mm -hmm. That's why we read no no read the bottom of uh, six. They might afterwards be of good cheer. We was of good cheer when they was getting killed. We didn't, we went, oh man. What about the white Oh, look at, look. Oh, right. He was such a good Pharaoh. He was good to us. We like, oh, get him. Get him. We was happy. Even the good ones. Uh, oh yeah, you know the good ones too. Right. Yeah, even the good ones. <laughs> and look, yeah, that's what happened. Let's go to Isaiah 43 and 1. Let's get some more on this paint. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 43 and verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Notice he keeps talking about redeem, redeem, redemption. This is a constant thing going on in the scriptures when you pay attention. That word pops up a lot. Read. When thou passes through the waters. This is talking about us going through the, the uh, I was about to say flood. That's not what I mean. When he parted the sea for us. Talking about us passing through the waters. I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Sabia for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, Thou hast been honorable and have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. He said that the Ethiopians, the Egyptians, and the Seba, he said he gave them their lives for us. That was the ransom. That was the payment. Right? Y'all understand what a ransom is, right? Yes, sir. Right? So he said this is the payment, their lives. To get you out and save your life, I'm taking their lives. 
I know some of y'all don't want that just because we got to get out of this captivity. And people got to die for us to go. Listen, I know your boss is nice to you sometimes, but they got to go. They got to go. This is the program. So, I mean, this, and because it's going to be the same thing this time. When we get out of this captivity, somebody got to go. When we got out of Babylon, people had to go. Everybody just wasn't sitting there smiling. People had death, death had to take part. Then, okay, now we can leave. So, now, let's go to, as a matter of fact, let's do this. Let's get that definition of ransom. Let's get it. This is ransom. A sum of money or other payment demanded or paid for the release of a prisoner. We were prisoners in Egypt. And he said, you know what, I'm going to pay you. Read verse 3. I'm going to pay you to get my people out of there. Isaiah 43 and verse 3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom. He's like, I'm going to give them the payment they need to let you go. <laughs> and the payment was their lives. <laughs> so now, after reading that and understanding what a ransom is, this scripture should make more sense. This is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. It says what? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He owns you, do I? Because he bought you for a price. What was that price? Other people's lives. That's how he got you. I'm killing them so I can obtain you. <laughs> Get Matthew 20 and 28. Somebody got to die. There's always somebody that has to die. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 20 and verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So for us to get back with the Most High, he had to give his life for what? A ransom. That was the payment. It has to be, somebody has to die. Every time. This time it was Christ. Back then it was Egypt. So, go ahead. Oh, I thought you had something to say. Oh, okay. So, now let me get Psalms 111 and 6. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 111 and verse 6. He hath showed his people the power of his works, that he may give them the heritage of the of the heathen. So he's going to give us the heathen as a heritage. Remember he said he's going to give us an everlasting heritage? That's your everlasting heritage. Them yours. When you see your people riding around, going to and fro, them yours. It's like a grocery store, just pick and choose. Let me get that more bite with that. Get that eat of my no, you see these these, these nice uh, uh Arabic children, they fresh. See, look at that. You can see the freshness, squeeze the head. <laughs> Take all these, these mine. Hey, oh, I'm sorry. I better still I better still a Christian up in here that's like, that's not right. That's just not right. Somebody's spirit. Yeah, right. Vexed right now. Right. Right, it's a conflict. It's a conflict. Like uh like a Star Wars, there's a conflict within them. <laughs> so I think it's a conflict. Right. <laughs> so this, they think this is the dark side of the right. forest, huh? <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> so, uh, what was we at? Uh, the, read on. Verse 7. The works of his hands are verity, are verity and judgment. All his commandments are short. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto Re his people. Redemption. Read again. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. So he sent redemption unto his people. How? By killing people. That's our redemption. That's how he got us back. That's how we have 
back to being a part of, the, uh, uh, of his people. Now we, we carry his name again. Now he acknowledges us as his people. Why? Because he had to kill those other people to get, so we can get that. Somebody's blood had to be spilled. But that obviously can't apply to everybody. You can't redeem, just like it had a, we read the example of a pawn shop. You can't redeem somebody else's stuff. You can't come in and you got your ticket for a jacket and they got their ticket for a TV and you say, no, this is my ticket, but I want that TV. No, you don't get you the jacket that connects to your ticket. You got the money and the ticket for your jacket. That's what we give you back. Not going to give you just random stuff. You can't go in there and pick anything. You got to get your stuff back. You can't redeem somebody else's stuff. Same with this. That's why the other nations, they were never the most honest. Why would he be redeeming them? They were never there. They were never his. He's redeeming us because we were his, and he's bringing us back. He's regaining us. Uh, go to Galatians 4. Oh, four and four. This is the book of Galatians, chapter four and verse four. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. This is talking about Christ. To redeem them that were under the law. To bring back those that were what? Un under the law. So Christ came to bring back those that were under the law. Was everybody on the planet under the law? So how would we even come to bring them back? That's plain, right? Come on. That we might receive the adoption of sons. That we might what? Receive the adoption of sons. Let's deal with the first part. Let's deal with the them that were under the law. Psalms 147, 19, and 20. Then we're going to come back to that Galatians. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 147, verse 19. Mm -hmm. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He have not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. He gave his laws and statutes and commandments only to Israel. And he did not give them to anybody else. So when we go back to Galatians and read verse 4, no, read 5 again. This is the book of Galatians, chapter 4, and verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law. The only ones under the law was Israel. So how could he be redeeming anybody else? How could he be regaining anybody else that he never had and they weren't under the law? That doesn't make sense. Read the next part. That we might receive the adoption of sons. Who is the adoption pertain to? Let's go to Romans 9. I mean, the answer is right here. Everybody can't be adopted. Hey, you got a lot of kids at the adoption agency, but he's coming to pick up his children. Uh, yeah, I want my children back. I want to redeem them. This is the book of Romans, chapter 9. You want verse 1? Uh, Sorry, 4. Verse 4. Who are Israelites mm -hmm. to whom pertaineth the adoption? That's right there playing. Who are Israelites? This is who we're talking to. To whom pertain the adoption. So when we just read in Galatians about the adoption of sons, that pertains to Israel. But read on. And the glory. And the glory. And the covenants. Covenants, plural. So the old covenant, the new covenant only pertain to Israel. Meaning he only made agreements with us. He never made an agreement with the Babylonians. He didn't make an agreement with the Assyrians. He made no agreements with nobody in the scriptures except Israel. Read. And the giving of the law. <laughs> Wait a minute, because remember he said he came to redeem them that were under the law. This says that the law only pertains to Israel. So that means he's only coming for Israel. Free. And the service of God. Mm -hmm. And the promises. And the promises only pertain to Israel. 
Get Romans 3.23. This is the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23. Famous Christian scripture that they don't understand. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Which you can always ask your Christian friends when they say this, what is sin? Because they're going to tell you that, no, we're not under the law, we're under grace. But all have sinned. Wait a minute, you're confusing me. You're saying all have broken the law, but we're not under the law. Well, how did you break it? It's they don't understand what sin is. They know what they're oh, lost. <laughs> like, and they will not let you set them straight. Mm -hmm. Nope, nah, I don't want to go back and forth. That's it. They're going to try to end that conversation quick because they know it's something kind of stupid to them. They're like, dang, this don't make sense. Just end it, end it, end it. <laughs> Finish. Verse 24. Be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, come on. Whom God has set forth to be a prop propitiation through faith in his blood. Uh -huh. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Give me the definition of propitiation. We, ask them, we have to know what that means. Go ahead. Definition of propitiation. The act of propitiating. See? You understand? <laughs> oh, okay. Read on. Something that propitiates. Now you understand. <laughs> Go ahead. Specifically, an atoning sacrifice. That's all they had to put. They didn't even need none of the rest of that stuff. <laughs> so, this is an atoning sacrifice. Read that scripture again now that we know what Propitiation is, verse 25. Verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. An atoning sacrifice. That's what Christ was. was he, he was a, a sacrifice to atone for what? Our sins. He was the propitiation of that. Read. Through faith in his blood. Mm -hmm. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God. And all of this was our redemption. So, go to Acts 3.18. Acts 3.18. Acts 3.18. Acts 3.18. This is the book of Acts, chapter 3, and verse 18. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer... He had so fulfilled. Christ suffered. He fulfilled the suffering. He fulfilled being the sacrifice for our sins. Go to Hebrews 10 and 6. And we're going to get some more on that part. And all of this is still going into our redemption. This is the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Mm -hmm. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Mm -hmm. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Mm -hmm. come on. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. What is that talking about, brothers? Somebody, real quick. Uh, let's get this one right here. Shalom, brother Aaron. He came to take away the first covenant to bring forth the second covenant. Exactly. I just want to make sure y'all follow. Me. Read on. Verse 10, by the which we, by the which will we are sac sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So that's why I was talking about he fulfilled the suffering because that was the propitiation for our sins. So now that was all dealing with the old covenant. Now we're going into the new covenant. 
Let's get Micah 14. I like New Covenant and we want to Micah. Yeah, let's go to Micah. Micah 4 and 10. This is the book of Micah, chapter 4 and verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So the Most High is supposed to redeem us from Babylon. As we know, that's talking about Babylon the Great, right? Which is what? America. Yeah, that's, uh, I'll take that. Yes. So he's going to redeem us out of America, the United States. He's going to redeem us the same way he redeemed us out of Egypt. It's not, oh, this time he's just going to redeem us out and you know, come and talk to the white man and have a conversation with him and see if they can come to an agreement and then let us go. No, he's going to come over here and kill and destroy. Then, through that, we will get to go. Because we need that payment. That payment is their lives. Our lives for their lives. So, let's get some more on that. So, the dog, go, to, go to Psalms 137. And seven. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 137 and verse 7. <clears throat> Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom mm -hmm. in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. So how did they reward us? It says, happy shall he be that reward you as you rewarded us. Well, how did they reward us? How are we re rewarded of Babylon or Edom? How did they reward us? What did they give us? Shackles and chains. Yeah, exactly. They gave us slavery. They gave us, what are they giving us now? They're giving us uh, low-income housing. They're giving us uh, welfare. They're giving us police brutality, worst health care, worst education. We're getting the bottom of everything. He says, happy is the man going to be that's able to reward you the way that you rewarded us. Meaning, y'all getting all that same stuff. I hope you're having fun with it because this is what you get. Right. So give me Second Ezra's uh, chapter eleven and forty. Let's see what they rewarded us with. So I mean, it's it's gonna be beautiful to me. It's gonna switch, and I'm telling you, you ain't gonna see your kids on the news. It's gonna be nothing. What you gonna see is, oh yeah, oh, they got another one of them. Look at them talking about the innocent. Lock him up for the rest of his life. That's what's gonna happen. Second Ezra's eleven and forty. Yep. Or seven and forty. Eleven and forty. This is the book of 2nd Ezra, chapter 11, and verse 40. <clears throat> and the fourth came and overcame all the beasts that were past. This is talking about, and Daniel talked about the four beasts. This is the fourth beast. This is talking about which we know is Babylon, America. Right? All right. Go ahead. And had power over the world with great fearfulness and over the whole and over the whole compass of the earth with much wicked oppression. With what? Much wicked oppression. This is how he rewarded us, with much wicked oppression. Guess what he getting back? Much wicked oppression. In Isaiah 49, 26. That's what I'm telling you, that's the stuff I'll be sitting at home thinking about, oh, I can't wait. I gotta see this. I'm telling you, that'd be the, my wife would tell you, that's my favorite thing, I gotta see this. When this go I gotta see it. This is the stuff that make me say, I gotta stay in the spirit. Somebody trying to take me over there? Nope, I'm not going over there with you. Because I gotta see this. I'm not missing out on this. Give me that. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, and verse 26. 
and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. He gonna do what? I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. And see, I'm the type of person, I'm a visual person. When I read scriptures, I be trying to visualize. And I just be visualizing you taking a chunk out of them and shoving it in their face and their mouth. I'm like, man, well, I'm not going to feed you with your own flesh. That's how I picture it. Somebody else might picture it different, but that's what comes to my mind. Read. And they shall be drunken with their own blood. Mm. Come on. As with sweet wine. <laughs> And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So you are gonna know that He your Redeemer when He's making, He's feeding them with their own flesh. They drunk on their own blood, and they gonna say, "Yeah, that's the Redeemer of Israel right there." <laughs> Let's get Isaiah fifty-nine and twenty. <laughs> This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, and verse 20. <clears throat> and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from the transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. It's saying unto them that return from transgression in Jacob. That's not everybody. That's one third. Two thirds of us are going to stay in transgression. They're going to say, no, I see, I think we can smoke weed. Uh, I don't see why we can't have seven wives. Whatever stuff people are battling with, I don't see why I can't go get drunk. It says he's going to redeem those. Read that again. Read that again. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgressions in Jacob. Did it say that he was going to redeem those that transgress anybody, any nation? Turn from term from transgressions in Jacob. In Jacob. It's always specified. It's always right there. The way you don't have to guess. Oh, well, I think that's talking about anybody. No, it's specific. Especially when you look at the wording. So, uh, did you finish that? Say of the Lord. Verse 21. Yeah, get that. Verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them. Now, he's about to tell you about the agreement with us. Say of the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So it, it said we're going to come to a point where we're going to have his word in our mouths all the way down through our children forever. Forever. All we're going to speak is righteousness. That's all we're going to have on our mouth. So go to Isaiah 63 and 1. So that's why, so he says he's going to redeem us. Let's see more about this redemption. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 63 and verse 1. So these are like happy scriptures to me. This is stuff I read and I'll be like, yeah. Come on. Who is this that cometh from Edom? That's very specific. He said, who is this that comes from Edom? He letting you know where he coming from. Read. With dyed garments from Basra. Mm -hmm. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, might, mighty to save. Mm -hmm. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? And thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat. I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. He said their blood will be sprinkled upon my garments. This is how he coming out of Edom. He said, look at, this is who came from Edom. So he went to Edom and did this, and then he got stopped on the way out of there, like, man, what, what happened? And he told me nothing. This is what happened. Read. For the day of vengeance is my, the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. The year of my redeemed, which is us, is come. He said, and during this, when he's doing this, this is for us. Every one of them he kill him is to bring us out of there, out of here. Come on. And I looked, 
and there was none to help. And I wonder that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. You know what he's saying? He's saying, my fury upheld me, meaning you might get a little tired you doing something over and over again. He was like, you know what? I'm so mad, it kept me going. His anger of thinking of all the stuff they did to us over the years kept them able to kill them, kill them efficiently. Like, nope, he just killed them like a machine. And every time he might be thinking, all right, that's enough. Nope, I remember, nope. Kill them some other. That just maintained him. He continued to be able to kill them based upon his anger and his fury that fueled him. Read. Yeah. Verse 6. And I will tread down the people in my anger and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. I will mention the, lo the loving kindness of the Lord. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Read that part again. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. How did we get to that? He just was talking about killing people in this fury of blood sprinkled everywhere. He's like, yeah, I'm gonna mention the loving kindness of the Lord. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, this is my kind of guy right here. So I love this. Come on. And the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us. He come killing them like, oh, praise the Lord. Praise him. Cutting off heads, body parts. Praise the Lord. Come on. And the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies, mm -hmm. and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. In all of our afflictions, he's afflicted. Just like if you saw your children going through something, wouldn't you be afflicted? I know you. I know you sisters would. You see your child going through any kind of stress, you feel stress. You don't want to see that going on your child or they going through problems, physical pain, whatever it is. That pains you. That's how the most I is. It's like this is paining him what we going through, but we gotta go through it. But. He says, in our affliction, he's afflicted. Come on. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bared them and carried them all the days of old. So that same word keeps popping up, the redeeming, the redeeming. Go to 1 Kings 6 and 13 for us. This is the book of 1 Kings, chapter 6 and verse 13. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. This is the stuff that we got to read to build us up. You know what? He's not going to forsake us. We thought he was, we, we, he was in Egypt. We didn't know that he was going to bring forth the deliverer. We thought that we hoped we heard prophecy, but we didn't see it. Even when we saw the deliverer, we didn't even accept that that was the deliverer. Just like when Christ walked among us, we didn't know that that was the, that was the Messiah. That, we put him to death. But he's like, no, 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 no. He's not going to forsake us. And that's the kind of stuff we got to keep in mind. He is not going to forsake us. Last scripture, let me get Titus 2 and 13. This is the book of Titus, chapter 2, and verse 13. Go ahead. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He's going to redeem us from all iniquity, meaning we have the opportunity to have our sins wiped out. And once we have our sins wiped out in Christ, guess what? We are not eligible to get the kingdom. Read that again. Who have gave himself for 13 us. Verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope. This is why we read the scripture all the time, Romans 15 and 4. 
This is where we get our comfort. This is where we get our hope. We're looking for this blessed hope. The hope for what? That we will be redeemed out of this. That we will be able to be forgiven for our sins. This is where we should be having our hope in. This is where our focus should be. Come on. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, <laughs> who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So that's letting you know the ones that are going to get it. The ones that are what? Peculiar and zealous of good works. So let me let you know, it's a specificity there. Did I say that right? Specificity. Is that wrong? Specificity? Did I make up something? Or is that right? Make it up. No, I ain't all that swift. Make it up. You know. <laughs> Write it down somewhere. As long as we know. <laughs> right. It works. But he said the zealous of good works. He's letting you know that this is also a requirement. So if you are not zealous of good works, if you just floating along, you know you Israel, yeah, you wear fringes, but you still living your own lifestyle. You're not zealous of good works. And if you coming in and all your head wrappers on point, but you still a demon, not being zealous of good works. Also, they said good works. What are you doing any works in the body? What are you doing? What are you doing to bring about the kingdom? Are you pushing this forward in any way? If not, you don't fall up under the requirements of being zealous of good works. So, I'm going to end the class there. Hopefully you'll be thinking about that, because me, I got to see this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure I'm zealous of good works. Daniel of Israel United in Christ. Please subscribe to our YouTube channels. Stay up to date with our latest events, music, and classroom lessons. IUIC plans to continue visiting different countries where this gospel has not been preached before. IUIC needs your help in pushing this truth. So join us, subscribe to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and podcasts, and stay up to date with us. For more information, please visit www.israelunite.org.